perhaps you even look younger. <laughs> so, happy pastor, happy church, right? <laughs> so I wonder, what is the other secrets apart from having a happy church? Uh, what is the other secrets that your pastor has? Yeah? Some of the words that he was speaking during the communion. I hope you were paying attention to what he was saying. Uh, because halfway through of what he was saying and I, I, I opened my eyes because I wanted to see if he was reading something or he was speaking impromptu off the cuff and he was speaking impromptu off the cuff yeah so that was impressive yeah but you know if we just get impressed and we don't ask ourselves how can these words change our lives then we will not be able to see any difference happen in our life. There's some very powerful things. I wish it was, it was recorded, right? Yeah, I wish it, you know, when you go back, where, where will this be? Will this be on your YouTube channel or something? So, you know, um, when you get a chance to finish this service and you go home, I suggest that you look for that part again. Listen to it a few times, you know. Um, and, and, and perhaps those words will suddenly give you an understanding of what the gospel actually means because it's about a change that happens inside us and we let go of our past so that we can embrace what God wants to do in this world through us. I think uh, that is what I got from listening to what he's saying about how God delivered us from our shame and our rejection and then God wants us to make an impact in the four corners of this world. See, I'm quoting him, some of the important words that he said, because they did make a difference. Let's open our hearts this morning to receive the word of the Lord. I want to teach you, not preach to you, but I want to teach you. Teaching basically means that it will be based on the text, and I want to open this text to you, and then after that, encourage you to take some steps of action on what we hear because hearing the word is important but it doesn't change our lives okay it is equal to building a house on the sand it looks good for a long time and then when the when it really matters it looks like all that we build our life for cannot stand up to the storms of life because we're all going to have storms in life so in order for us to go through the storms we need to exercise our muscles. We, we, we don't, you know, we look at these athletes, they don't go to the actual competition and then start to exercise and practice in the competition. <laughs> no, people practice and train to go for the competition. Okay? So all of us going to face, in a manner of speaking, competition. Not yet, maybe. Some of us are going to go through the storms of life where we need to learn how to compete against the challenge, compete against the forces that bring this challenge to us. But now is the time to exercise our faith. Now is the time for us when we receive the word that we must act on the word. Okay? Amen? All right. So I just want to ask if the PowerPoint team, the multimedia team at the back there, would you be so kind as to help me so that I don't have to use this clicker, right? So I can concentrate on other things, right? So when I say next, then you go next. But don't go too fast, right? Okay? All right. So if you go too fast, it's okay. Not end of the world. We can always go back. <laughs> All right. So this morning, I want to speak to you from... Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. And you want to position your Bibles. If you have your Bibles with you, you want to position your Bibles to that. I'll have it on the screen anyway, and I will read it from the screen. But I, I want you to also have it open in front of you, right? So there are two titles to my sermon. I couldn't decide which title to have. So I have a main title and a subtitle. This is my main title. Faith moves mountains, but hope plants trees. Faith is our response to a clear promise from God, okay? So like <clears throat> this morning, I showed up here because uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, Sister Li Ling contacted me, okay? So based on that invitation, I came here, right? Now, I have been to churches where I showed up on the time that I was invited and then it was a miscommunication. They, they told me the wrong date <laughs> or they already arranged another speaker. And so... That happens often, but it does happen. Yeah? But the reason why I came is because I'm responding to an invitation. So faith is a response to an invitation. 
Okay? Now, what is hope? Hope is an action that we take when there is no invitation. <laughs> okay? So, it's like when a church member invite me to the house to come to, my, to the house at 7 o'clock at night. And I said, oh, what is the occasion? And he said, oh, no, no, just come, just come. <laughs> now, 7 o'clock at night for me is dinner time. So, I have a question mark in my mind when I go to this person's house. Are they inviting me for dinner? Or just inviting me to go there and talk? <laughs> and I really asked, uh, what is happening? And you said, nothing, just come, right? So I have to think now in my mind, do I go there on empty stomach and then be very grumpy <laughs> because <laughs> there's no, no dinner and I'm going to be there for two, three hours, I'm going to be hungry and I cannot concentrate on what's happening? Or, or <laughs> do I eat first? and then go there and regret because there was very nice food there and I'm already full. <laughs> so, how I go there depends on my, on my hope. And hope is not based on invitation. Hope is based on two things. Number one, my belief. Okay, now, if there is a promise, then it's no longer based on my belief. It's based on what do I think about that person? When that person said, you please come here and speak on this day, do I believe those person's words? If I do, then it's not about me, it's about my belief in that person. But hope is when there's no invitation, there's no promise. So when there's no invitation and there's no promise, then why should you believe? Because that's was in your heart. So hope, firstly, comes from in your heart, from who you are, from how you have been developed all these years. That's number one. Number two, hope depends also on the character of the person involved, the other side of the coin. Now, there's two difference. There's a difference here between depending on a person's promise and depending on a person's character that didn't come with a promise. So we can have faith in the promises of God. But when there's no promise, do you still have hope? Faith moves mountains. So when you have faith, then you, then you exercise your faith, there would be an outcome. The Bible tells us that if you have faith, as, even as... As, as the size of a mustard seed, it can still move mountains. Of course, we know that we're not going to move mountains, right? <laughs> we're not going to go to Jelebu and move the Jelebu hills, right? <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. This is uh, a figure of speech. It's difficult to move mountains, yes. But what's the point if you move a mountain when your problem is solved? No. There are quote-unquote mountains in your life that need to be moved. <laughs> without moving the real physical mountain. Doesn't, doesn't those physical mountains being moved doesn't change your circumstance. But there are situations in your life which appear to be like mountains. And those, when they are removed, make a difference in your life. You understand what I'm saying? Amen? That's, that's faith. But then, there's hope. When nobody asks you, nobody promises you, nobody opens any door for you, you still want to plant a tree. And this is the this is the marvelous thing about planting a tree. Sometimes when we sow a seed and plant a tree, we do know because we can make the calculation that when this tree comes to fruition, when this tree matures, you will not be alive anymore. Then why plant the tree? So you can see I have a little bit of bias in the way that I'm framing it. Yes, anyone can have faith but it takes a special kind of person to have hope. Because hope is not motivated by self-interest. Because we do recognize sometimes when you plant the tree, it will not provide a shade for you. Because by the time the tree comes to maturity, it's not for you. Then why do it? That's why I said hope. Special type of person to do that. So, there are these four scenarios I'm going to talk to you as we go along, you know. Uh, if we are passive people, then of course, <laughs> we're not going to be moving mountains, we're not going to be planting trees, we do nothing. And I'm not talking to passive people this morning, I hope. And I trust. 
Now, then we can have pessimistic people. And I want to tell you up front what I'm going to say to you later, so that when I say it to you later, it'll be the second time. Nobody is born pessimistic. We learn to be pessimistic. Likewise, number three, nobody is born to be optimistic. We learn to be optimistic. Okay? But I want you to know also that Jesus' teaching sounds full of hope and faith. But it's not so that it bring us to a place of optimism. That is just positive thinking. You don't need to hear the truth to be a positive person because there are so many other things that can be taught to you to make you very positive. But Jesus, when we hear the truth and we act on the truth, it's called dynamic faith. Dynamism. Why do we need dynamism? Because as much as we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, you and I do not know all that is ahead of us. And that's why when you're dynamic, you can adapt, you can be flexible. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So, my subtitle, my main title is Faith Moves Mountains, Hope Plants Trees. But my subtitle, because I couldn't I couldn't decide which one I want to go with, so I doesn't have both, okay? And this is what I would call as a self-talk. All of us have self-talk, okay? Uh, obviously, we don't talk loudly when we're talking to ourselves, right? Because then people will wonder if you're mentally okay. Yeah? But we all have self-talk. There is an inner voice and it's not necessarily the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's always an inner voice in us. And... I want to share with you what I think was the inner voice of this woman in the parable that Jesus taught in Luke's Gospel chapter 18. This is the parable. In this parable, there was a widow. And I think inside her heart, there, was this, there were these words, if not today, then tomorrow. Because my life doesn't end today, then I can try again tomorrow okay so let's move on to the third slide by the way i have 12 slides so i am already now like 25 percent of the way through <laughs> the slides i don't know whether it's 25 percent of the way through the time <laughs> all right it all depends on you eh? if you if you look very active and responsive i go faster you look very slow and not really paying attention i may even go slower <laughs> so please be very enthusiastic okay <laughs> Please look at me, please, please smile, and even if it's not funny, so just laugh. Then, then somehow I go faster, you see like this now, it's not funny, so you laugh, so I just went faster already, right? Okay, so I'm very tempted to ask you to stand while I read this, but I won't, okay? Because I'm not going to read it straight. I'm also going to stop and give some observation. So Luke's Gospel, chapter 18 verses 1 to 8, but I'm going to only read first six verses, and then I want to ex explain a little bit, and then we will go on to the last two verses and conclude there. <clears throat> so, in verse 1, Luke writing, right? This is Luke writing. And so, if you're having your Bible, verse 1 is not in red ink, because it's Luke writing. Oh, the, the, the author of the Gospel of Luke, he's writing, and he kind of spoiled the parable for us, you know, you know when they say spoiler? <laughs> Before you watch the movie, people tell you the ending. <laughs> so this is what Luke's Gospel chapter 18 verse 1 is all about. <laughs> this is a spoiler. <laughs> he, he's telling us, if you don't want to read the whole parable, I tell you what it means. <laughs> or, there's some of you so blur, you read 10 times or so, you still don't understand what the parable is about. I tell you what it means, so you don't get confused. You know before you read. So he's saying to you, you see, this parable is telling you two things. You should pray and not give up. There are people who don't pray and give up. I hope that's not you. There are people who pray and give up. I also hope that's not you because that's equally useless as the first one. You know, 
If you pray and give up, it's useless. Why do I say that? Because Jesus is saying, pray and don't give up. That means both are important. If you have one and with not the other, it just doesn't work. Number three, you could have people, this is, to me, in my mind, is impossible, but it can happen. It can happen. This is where I'm saying to you, that's why Jesus didn't just teach positive thinking. Because in positive thinking, you don't have to pray, but you don't give up. So there are some people who have been taught, don't worry about praying. All those are for people who are Christian people. We don't have to do that. We only need to have positive thinking and we don't give up. The sad thing is, the sad thing is, actually this is better than the first two. What is the first two? Don't pray, don't give up. This is totally useless. Lah. Okay? We are not useless people. Number two, you pray and then you give up. This is confusing people. Then why did you pray in the first place if you want to give up? Okay? But this is also equally useless. This is what I call so far and not far enough. Almost. These are the almost people. You already pray already, but then why you give up? It would be better if, number three, you never prayed, but you never gave up. In life, those people will go further than those who pray and give up. But this is not Jesus' teaching. Jesus' teaching is the fourth one. Hey, you pray and you don't give up. The key word is the word and. Actually, right there is the whole sermon. I could stop there and finish already. We can just go home now. <laughs> But since the, your church is so generous and you give me, how, how long you give me? Oh, okay. I think your church didn't quite understand, you know. Pastor, Pastor Kwan didn't quite understand my, my purpose of asking this question. Most of the time, people, when I ask them, how much time? They will very politely say, up to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will use my anointing to know that means 45 minutes. <laughs> Now what your pastor said is 45 minutes, then I might use my anointing wrongly to say, I think what he means is up to you. <laughs> no, no, no. I think his 45 minutes means 45 minutes. Where's the timer? Normally in most churches got timer. Ma, we got no timer here. Huh? No, no, no. This, that's a clock. That's not a timer. In, in other churches, there's a timer which is counting down, you know. So when I'm looking at the back, I'm not looking at the, the, the multimedia guy. I'm, I'm fighting with the time. And then there'll be a time there whereby it's at minus five, my God. <laughs> this means I really... Okay, by the way, uh, I, I spent two minutes talking all these things. must give me back. Uh, <laughs> you give me back the two minutes because it's not part of the sermon. Okay? Uh, please time the, the clock there. Actually, sorry, uh, Pastor, Pastor Kwan, I, I sat so bad, uh, I can't see the clock. Uh. So if I preach too long, uh, please don't be upset. <laughs> I think next time I come, right, you're going to have me a timer, they surely. We pick timer there, come down. <laughs> okay. So what's my point? Verse 2. Now Jesus shares this parable. But remember, what is the conclusion? You pray and don't give up. The key word, and. Okay. So it's just like, you know, your wife told you before you got married, eh? the, time, the time is your wife to be, like she said to you, you must marry me and take care of me. You only heard the first part. <laughs> you think it's going to be a happy marriage? No. You see, the word and can be very important. You just marry her, but you didn't take care of her. <laughs> so, you must marry me and take care of me. You must pray and not give up. So, Jesus said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Fearless. Careless, he don't care. Like, I'm not sh that's not the correct word for, for don't care. La, right? It doesn't mean careless, he don't care. Careless means something else. That means uh, this person was indifferent. Fearless, indifferent. He didn't fear God, he didn't fear man. Wow. 
sound like a self-made man. And then there was a widow in that town who kept coming to the judge with her case. She had a plea. She said, please give me this justice against the person who has disadvantaged me. All right? What is a judge there for? A judge is there to provide justice. Now, for some time, this judge refused to do his job. Now, you know I'm not really reading, right? <laughs> I am expanding the, the, the scripture here, but I'm not going against the meaning of the scripture, right? But the judge refused to do what he was supposed to do. He just refused her. And finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God, I don't really care what people think, Let's go to the next slide. Slide number four now. Yet, because this widow, she keeps coming back. She's persistent. She doesn't give up. She came a few times. Okay? Now, I hope you got this. I'm going to stop here for a minute. The judge is a powerful man. Actually, the Bible doesn't tell us it's a man. But I think it is a fair assumption in those days the judge would have been a man. But the widow is very clear. The word widow, you shouldn't ask me, Pastor, this one is male or female? I would say go back to school, learn English. Widow, not window, not widower, widow. Widow means woman who has lost her husband. So the judge presumably, fair assumption, male. The person who kept coming to her, a woman, who's now a widow. And in those societies, of those times, the power distance between the judge and the widow would have been great. It's, it's like a nobody trying to see a very powerful man in this land, not to ask for favor, <laughs> just to ask the guy to do his job. In, in, the, in this world, in today's time, it would be even tough to meet the guy because you have to meet the person who can introduce you to the person, who can introduce you to the person who can make the appointment. Not even sure whether you can finally meet the guy. You've got so many gatekeepers. But in, in this story, at least the woman had the access to the man. But then this man, remember this, he is not concerned about God. He's not concerned about people. So why should he care about this nobody woman? She can't do anything for him. He can do anything for her. He, sorry, he can do something for her. But if he did something for her, what would she do back in return for him? There was nothing for him to gain. So he brushed her away. She is a powerless person. He doesn't have to entertain her. Even the powerful people on the land, and that they probably he wouldn't have entertained them anyway because the, the scripture tells us the way the, Jesus said the story, this man is not afraid of anybody. So why should he be even moved by a widow? So this widow, if she kept going back, it must be because she had hope. I told you before, hope would be firstly born out of what is in your own heart, your belief that comes from yourself. There is nothing outside of her to suggest that she should have hope because this person, first of all, his reputation is he just ignores people. He doesn't want to do his job. Why should she, why should she believe that this guy would entertain her in any way based on the few times that she already encountered him. He just did what was already expected. He just brushed her off. Don't talk about faith. There was no reason to hope. But what the, in this parable, okay, by the way, let me stop here, pause. Eh? Don't count this one, okay? It was one time after a service, I was preaching on some other parable, and the person came and said, Pastor, why you take the parable so seriously? It's only a story, right? 
And I really just wanted to ignore the person, but I couldn't tahan, you know. So I said, if I am looking to you like a foolish person for taking a story so seriously, then you must be even more foolish than me to listen to a person who took a story so foolishly and you thought he was foolish. You are foolisher than the foolish me. <laughs> and you say, Pastor, why, why, why are you so angry? I said, because you, you, you can think deeper. Jesus used a parable to bring forth truth. Because you focus on the method, you don't get the truth. Okay? When, when, when Jesus shared a parable, it's not like somebody making a movie, okay? Movies are fictional, yes, I do that. But when Jesus uses a parable, it's not like he's making a movie and he's a director, want to win some award and make some money. No. He's using the parable, which by the way is full of realistic details. Okay? There's, there's, there's enough reason to believe that this story is realistic. Probably based on something that Jesus either heard or he observed in that day. Because the story is to, to people in those days, if you tell them a parable, but the parable is full of unrealistic story, for example, the woman went to the elephant and asked the elephant to give her justice. Come on, what, what, this is not a parable, this is a fable. So Jesus' parable is full of realistic details. But don't get stuck in the parable and argue about it. This parable is fiction, right? <laughs> why you take it so seriously? No, no, no. The reason why I take the parable so seriously is because this is just a tool to explain truth. If I don't take this parable seriously, I wouldn't get the truth. Okay, so give me back my three minutes now. <laughs> this parable contains truth. We must not dismiss the parable because then we will miss the truth. The woman did not know that her persistence was wearing down the judge. See? This is what Jesus is saying. When you move in hope, you don't know what you are doing to the other side. If you give up too soon, you give the other side breathing space. You don't know what is going on on the other side. That's the reason why you must pray and not give up. So this, this man is now thinking himself in his mind, hey, but this widow, because she keeps on bothering me. You see, I don't care about God. I don't care about other people, but I do care about my comfort. She's bothering me. There's one person I care about myself. She's bothering me. I better give her what she wants. Whether she deserves it or not, I better give her what she wants because who knows, maybe finally she will come and attack me. She's so aggressive. See, even this, even this, this judge who didn't fear God, fear the widow. And verse 6, and I'm going to explain a bit more. And the Lord, don't forget, Jesus is telling the story. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Okay? Hmm. How many people so far in this parable? Jesus is not in the parable, okay? Because Jesus is telling us the parable. Luke is not in the parable because the author of Luke is recording the parable. So how many people in the parable? Only two. The widow and the judge. God is not yet in this parable. Because there are people who have told me before, the judge is God, right? Come on. Did you read verse 6? And see what the unjust judge said. Would Jesus describe God as an unjust judge? No. Okay? God is going to come into the picture, but not now. Verse 7 and 8. Let's stop here and go to the next slide. We are counting this slide number 5. So this is my dram dramatization of what we just read. Okay? 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a little bit. Huh? Okay. All right. So, you can see this uh, photo here. On the right is who? On, 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 the, on the right. On the video, right? How you know you met her before? <laughs> I think this is a realistic picture of how the video would be like, right? How, how do you know the video? Because woman, we, we just talked about a story where we have two, two, two characters, and we said one of the characters definitely a woman, and she's a widow, right? So according to the way our mind works, the widow is a woman, she'd be wearing black. Okay, so there it is. And, and then on the left, who else? Judge. As, as I said to you, I don't know if it's a man, but I think it's a fair assumption it's a man. This is the fearless judge. And look at who is running away and who is attacking who. Now, of course, she didn't attack him, she didn't threaten him. But it was her persistence. It was her persistence that made it seem in the mind of the judge I, I should give in to this woman. And let me point something else out to you. The widow is not pictured praying at all. Prayer has not come into this story yet. We have already read 75% of the parable. Prayer hasn't come into the parable yet. Seems like Jesus is emphasizing the second part of the two points. The two points were pray and don't give up. Looks like the first six verses, the 75% of the eight verses, what's being emphasized there is don't give up. So, the judge, in his mind, his mindset, I don't fear God. I have no regard for what people think. I don't care. Please, press the button. And this is the widow, her self-talk. You don't care? Well, I don't give up. You turn me down, I'll be back. Please press the button. And the judge says, I still don't care. Why? Because the way he said it is, she will keep bothering me. If a person only came to you one time, you wouldn't come to that conclusion, she would keep bothering me. She must have gone to him in the parable a few times. I don't care. And let's go on. Oh, she says, <laughs> you don't care? Well, tomorrow's another day. I'll be back. Now, since Jesus emphasized the woman's attitude, I'm elaborating here because I want this to come across to you. Continue. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I give up. Finally, the man who doesn't fear God, who doesn't care what people think, he gave up. And the woman said, thank you, the multimedia guys, they already can read my mind. <laughs> One step ahead of me. She said, finally, she said, today, now, this is all not in the parable, eh? I, I took some liberty to imagine myself in the widow's position. She said, hey, today, 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 the day that you give me what I wanted, today is the day, today is the reason, this day, this moment is the reason why I didn't give up yesterday. Yesterday, I knew today will come. If I didn't give up, today is the proof that what I did all those yesterdays is right. Can you see Jesus emphasizing the woman's attitude? Let's go on. <laughs> I'm running out of time. What, what time is it? Uh, 45 minutes and 11.45, is it? Yeah, so I've got 20 minutes. Let me quickly run through this. Eh? <coughs> I said to you earlier part that pessimism, which is always imagining the worst, even if 
bad things do happen. They don't happen all the time. But a pessimistic person always imagine that things will always become bad. And they're always waiting to be proven correct. So when the good things happen, no, 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 no. These good things is not forever. It, it, it will change very fast. This is a pessimistic person. And the next slide, but we're not going to the next slide yet, so hold on. I'm going to say the same thing, that optimistic people also are like that. When bad things happen, they will say, hey, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> There's always tomorrow. So the, the, the widow, the widow has no reason to be optimistic. Husband died. She went to another man to ask him to give her justice. She just asked that man to do his job. And he didn't even bother to listen to her case. So she has no reason to be optimistic. If she is optimistic, it is because of something that she has learned along the way. So, in the 1960s, there was this psychologist by the name of Martin Seligman who did this experiment. Okay? I, I'm just saying what they did. Eh? I'm not telling you this is a good thing and then please don't, I, I don't say this kind of, say, how come they do that? How come you tell stories which are very cruel to animals? I'm just telling you what people did in the past to bring a point across. Okay? So this man, Martin Seligman, is a psychologist and he had this belief or he had this hypothesis that human beings could be trained or could be conditioned to become pessimistic. They could be trained to become optimistic. So to, to, to do this experiment, he couldn't use human beings because it would not be allowed by the law. He did use it on dogs. I, I don't think today they can do it on dogs anymore because uh, this would be considered cruelty to animals. Eh? Okay? So it's not like I'm... Uh, supporting what he did. I'm just saying what, this is what happened in the 1960s. So, there were two sets of dogs. When you do experiment, as Dr. Kong will tell you, there must always be a control group. Okay, there were two sets of dogs. So, the first set of dogs were put in this um, glass area and, it, 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 and on one side of the glass area was electrified, the one where the dogs are. And then there's a small barrier to the other side which is not electrified. But of course, the dogs don't know that the other side is not electrified. They only know there's a barrier in between this side and the other side. So, these dogs that were in the side that the dog, you see the dog there. <coughs> if the dog tried to move to go to the other side, because it was electrified, they would increase the electrical dosage to give the dog a shock. Every time the dog tried to move, there would be a shock. And this was done repeatedly over and over again. Making this dog feel hopeless, helpless, and thinking that whatever I do would be useless. Eventually, the electrical um, mechanism was switched off. But how were the dogs supposed to know? Because they had already been conditioned by the past that whatever you do is useless. It's not going to change your circumstance. So Seligman said, people who have continuously in life learned hopelessness. Nothing will change. Even when they are given an opportunity an open door, they won't move because they will say, by the time I reach the door, the door will close. So you see some of the work that the church is doing, especially the work with the refugees, is trying to reverse their mindset. That there is some intervention that can change your life. Not everything is hopeless, useless, and up to you alone. It's trying to change mindset. Seligman said that people who have learned helplessness and they become totally pessimistic, and there are some people around us like that, right? They will say, this is supposed to happen to me because this is the cross I'm supposed to bear. You know, last time there was Job, now it's me. It's my turn. Okay, I have to accept it. And this storm, like when we go through COVID, right? This storm will never end. We're all going to die. Forever will happen, no matter what I've done. You know, there's people come to me for counselling. I don't know why they come to me for counselling when for two hours they talk one hour, 59 minutes. 
And it's not like I got one minute to talk. I have, the one minute I had was never one continuous minute, I only have 10 seconds. The moment I say something after 10 seconds, I say, but, 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 then I stop, okay, okay, continue. <laughs> they will continue. And then after another half an hour, I said, okay, I listened to you enough. Now let me continue what I said about 29 minutes ago. But um, I already done that. I know that. Cut off already. So I was like, actually, what you come here for? If you want to talk. <laughs> because they already made up their mind. They already know the conclusion. They just want me to agree. Yes, you are very unique. You are hopeless. See, pastor, I told you, I'm hopeless one. <laughs> yes, you are hopeless. They just wanted that conclusion. And then, you know, Pastor, my car now gone into workshop, right? This is the reason why I need to commit suicide. Hello, it's only your car gone into your car gone into the uh, into the workshop. You are not a Grab driver. You can still take Grab. There's still other things you can do. Why must commit? No, no, because this is the beginning of the end. Why would you frame it like that? Because they must have gone through life where every little thing that they did, somebody. Something happened that knocked them down. Okay, next slide. I think it's slide number six or seven now. So, I told you there was a control group in this experiment. Same type of dog breed put in another environment, whereby this time, this time, also electrified, if you didn't move, you would get a jolt. The first one, every time you try to escape that part, there would be a jolt to say stop. This one, if you don't move, there will be a jolt. So, the, the barrier was still the same. The dogs, after a while, learned that if they didn't want to be electrocuted, they didn't want this electric shock, they need to keep on moving. This is what we try to do in preaching every Sunday. We're trying to tell you, if you stop moving, nobody can help you already. If you stop believing and you stop acting, nothing else can be done for you. We can all lay hands on you, only change your hairstyle. That's the first time you laugh in 15 minutes. That's why my sermon is going very slow. <laughs> so, Seligman said, for these people, like these dogs, after a while, they learn that they can jump over already. They have to jump over. Because if they don't jump over, they're going to be receiving that electric shock. They learned then that the bad things that happen in my life, they're not because I'm bad. That is the message of the book of Job. Not all bad things happen because I make mistakes. In fact, I can use this bad thing to make me stronger, better, more suitable, for bigger opportunities. And you know what? Nothing in life is permanent. Bad times don't last forever. There's a book I read when I was, okay, I don't want to say my age, huh, because then you go look at the book and say, what year the book was written, then you can guess my age. Huh? Okay. <laughs> but as some of you might know, I did my secondary schooling in St. Paul's Ramban, so I read this book when I was form two, a young Christian believer. Title of the book, I don't need to go into the book, eh? but if you can get the book, it would be good for you. The title of the book itself speaks volumes. Tough times never last, but tough people do. You will outlast your tough times. I think that book is about maybe 100 over pages. I think it's a good exposition on the widow's attitude in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Even these bad times, it will never last. And so, every bad time or every cloud has a silver lining. Within this bad time is the seeds for my breakthrough. The bad times is a package deal. It comes with the seeds for my breakthrough. You only need to read the story of Joseph many, many times to understand that all his problems also contain the seeds for the solution to not only his problems, 
but the solution to the problems of his whole family. So, let's go. Next slide. Let me explain this to you. You saw this at the very beginning, and actually I had already explained it to you before in other ways. There are at least three types of people here. The passive, the passive people, which I really hope is not you. There are lots of people who hear and don't do anything. They don't pray, they don't act, and there's nothing that we can do for these people. They are just passive people. But, but they are passive people who continuously like to tell us their bad stories. So, sorry if I say this, but I'm not talking about you anyway, right? I'm talking about some other people. They are a near nuisance. They make your pastor grow old. Okay, since your pastor look young, I know that such people don't exist here. <laughs> okay. Now, how about number two? Number two to me is equally useless as number one. You pray, you pray so much, but you don't do anything after you pray. Pastor, I pray really fast, you know. Last year, I fasted and prayed 365 days. Well, every day also you fast? Yes. Pray? Yes. I still didn't get my job. How many jobs did you apply for? I didn't apply for anything, but I prayed very hard. <laughs> mm. Did you read Luke 18 verse 1 before? Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. That's about prayer, right? I pray, I pray. I keep on knocking on the door. <laughs> no, you didn't knock on any door. You didn't even get out of your room. How could you be knocking on anybody's door? <laughs> so, these are pessimistic people and they end up in the same boat as the pass passive people. They pray a lot. Uh, they, are, they get dehydrated because they are prayer, then they, all their you know, energy and saliva dry up already, so they get dehydrated. But then apart from that, there's no other result. Now, there's a third one, which, which is unfortunate. Why? Because the third people don't pray, but they act a lot. They have better outcome than the first and second one. And it's really tragic, especially when you compare number three with number two. Why? Because you say, what's the point you go to church? You pray, you hear all the sermon. In fact, some of you also preach in the church. But look at your life, never change. So there's a proof. There's a proof that your, your, your faith is based on something not true because we can't see any result. No, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that there's no power to your, the truth that you're listening. It's just that you are a bad advertisement. You're the bad product. So if you drive some cars, if you go to the highway, right? You go to the highway, they want to pay your toll, right? You can see some of the cars, they open door, right? Other cars, they bring their power window down, right? And you can see that some, is, some are good products, some are bad products. It doesn't mean cars are all bad, right? Just because you see some accident doesn't mean we stop driving because all cars are bad. Like it's not, are some, all drivers are bad. There are some bad drivers. So we have something called a bad advertisement, a bad product. Number two is a bad product, it's a bad advertisement. But Jesus is not teaching us to be number three, okay? Even though if you stop reading the parable at verse six, that is the point that you're going to get. But Luke saves us in verse one by saying, hey, Jesus taught his disciples, pray and don't give up. Not Jesus taught his disciples, don't give up. So that's, of course, you know what is number four already, but I'm not going to say it to you. You can figure it out in your mind. Let's go on. So Jesus didn't just teach optimism. Press one more time, please. <clears throat> Jesus, remember his words. Remember the words that uh, Luke wrote in verse one. Always pray. Go back to your verse one in the Bible and see. Not just pray. Always pray. The frequency is 24-7. Always be in a state of prayer and acting. It's prayer and acting. Prayer doesn't mean that we don't have to act. And acting doesn't mean that, oh, if we can act, then prayer is not necessary. No, no, we, we, we want to remember that these two go together. Just like a bird, if you only have one strong wing and the other wing is not functioning, it's not going to work. You can't take off. So let's go to verse 7. Second part of the parable. 
And the second part of the parable, every time you read Jesus' parable, don't make up your mind until you read the last few verses. Sometimes it's the last verse. There's always a twist which changes the entire meaning. If you don't read the entire parable or you focus on the main thing in the parable, you think that the main thing in the parable is what is covered most, you get the wrong meaning. Jesus is not encouraging us to just be people who never give up. No, there is another part to this. And Jesus, in verse 7, continues, he says, and this is in your, if it's in your Bible, it will be in red ink. He says, Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? See, God is not like this judge. This judge is a terrible example. God is the other extreme. The judge is slow to act. God wants to act fast. God wants to give justice to his people who cry out to him day and night. See, this is a rhetorical question. The answer to this is, yes, of course. God being a God of justice, of course he wants to give his people justice who are crying out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? Of course not. But in the second part of verse 7, there is something implied there. He will not answer immediately. Eh? Come on, Pastor, you said that God wants to act. I said yes, he wants to act. But I didn't say he wants to act instantly. He's not, a, he's not like an instant noodle type of package, okay? Why? Why he doesn't act instantly? I'll tell you soon. Because it's verse 8, you get the answer. He says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. But when the Son of Man comes back again, I'm going to read this last part. Yeah? Are you paying attention? If I read wrongly, you say, go home. If, you, if I read correctly, you say, don't stop preaching. Preach one hour. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay? If I read wrongly, you say, go home. If I read correctly, you say, preach on. Okay? However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find justice on the earth? Hey, I didn't get a response from you, you know? This is not counted, eh? <laughs> I read again. I thought you said you're following me, right? However, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find justice on the earth? You asked me to continue. You're happy that I read wrongly. <laughs> what is this? Are you paying attention? <laughs> I, I think, yeah, Pastor, 45 minutes is about time really. They, they, they cannot continue already. They cannot follow. <laughs> I stop. I stop. I try one more time. Eh? However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I asked you to tell me continue or go home and you don't know what, yes. <laughs> You're answering something else. <laughs> now you say continue. Hey, listen. The widow is looking for justice. But God is looking for faith. So there's the twist here. You want to become like me? You make sure what you're looking for is like what I'm looking for. I can give you what you want. But if I give you what you want, at the end when I come, you will be totally disappointed because you will not be what I'm looking for. And then, and then, you will say, I thought, I thought you won't reject me. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't understand what I was looking for. I mean, it's like, it's like this couple, eh? the, 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 the girl has to go and study overseas for 10 years. The guy stays back in Malaysia. After 10 years, he came back, and then the boy totally changed with different values. Then the, the, the girl said, I don't want to marry you anymore. And then she said, how come you reject me? You Christian, how can you reject me? Your God doesn't reject me, you reject me. But you promised to marry me. Yes, I promised to marry you, but the promise has certain conditions. You're no longer what I'm looking for. You changed. I didn't change. You changed. You changed. So you don't expect the woman to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll still marry you even though I'm going to suffer for the rest of my life. No. That's not what we're going to do. So you, you, know, you might be looking for certain breakthrough in your life. Yeah, yeah, that's all fine. 
And God wants to give that to you because He's a good God. See, but the sad thing is there are a lot of Christians that want to please God. They want to be what that God wants them to be. And then you must understand the truth. The truth is, God is not really concerned about how much breakthrough you can receive from Him. Why should He be concerned about it? Because they're coming from Him anyway. God is looking for faith. And to exercise faith. And I suppose with this also implies hope then we must give you time. If the widow got her request granted the very first time, there's no parable. It has to be granted after a few times. There has to be delay. Because only through delay, we can have faith. Next slide. Next slide. Look at the white side. Okay? Don't look at the black side. Prayer doesn't change God. Because God wants to give you all the good things. Prayer is not about persuading God to change his mind. You, you know, God, you seem to be reluctant, right? No, no. You got the wrong person. That's the judge. I am not the judge. I'm not the unjust judge. I am the God that wants to give you all the good things. So don't think that your prayer is about changing God's mind. Prayer also, okay, prayer definitely won't change God. Prayer may or may not change your circumstances. This part I'm not sure. It can, maybe it won't. I mean, for example, you're not happy with the kids you have. Then you pray, God, give me another set of kids. I cannot imagine in my mind God answering this prayer. <laughs> God might change your kid's heart. But if He changed your kid's heart very fast, then He can't change you. Because maybe... A part, the other part of the equation is you also need to change. So we cannot always say, God, I already ordered the food. The food has already come. I don't like what I ordered. Especially after I already eaten two mouthful. I pray now the food change. I, I hope you don't believe in such kind of, I uh, only can say this, mambo jumbo. So God, Prayer can change circumstances. Maybe it will change. You know, there was a man in the Bible, in the Old Testament, called Daniel. And he was a man who prayed every day three times. Constantly. No day he missed his prayer. But you know, he never, he, 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 was, a, he was a person who came from Judah, he went into captivity, lived in Babylon. And there is no record of him ever going back to Jerusalem. He was a man who prayed. He prayed that his people would go back to Jerusalem. And his prayer did help his people go back to Jerusalem, but he himself never experienced it. Prayer can change circumstances, but not all the time. The third part, let's go on. This one I'm 100% sure. <laughs> the real idea of prayer is to change us. And that's why there must be delay. Prayer imparts something intangible. Last slide. Actually, second last slide. Okay. Yeah. That's what I mean by dynamism. You pray recognizing that prayer is meant to change you. Prayer is not about changing what you don't like around you. Prayer is about changing you, changing us, so that we become aligned with what God wants. Because honestly, God is a good God. He will give you good things. Even if you do not pray, He will give it to you. So let's end with this. Last slide. What I've spoken to you today, 
because I couldn't make up my mind what my title was. I have two titles. Number one, Faith Moves Mountains, Hope Plants Trees. Faith is about responding to God's promise and God's invitation. But hope is about doing something really long term that will outlast you even when there is no clear instruction from God. But because you believe in the character of, the, of, of God, that God is a God who definitely wants to give you good things. He might delay it, but if He delays it, it's not because He wants to harm you. He, will, he might delay it because He wants you to grow. So you learn how to move in hope as well. There are some people who say, I, I move in the voice of God or in the, in the prophetic. That's good. But do remember that God doesn't always speak to us. And, and if you try to squeeze a voice, it may not be a voice of God. But there's always hope. There's always faith. And this comes by us reflecting on the truth of God's word. My second point was about, if not today, then it's tomorrow. Always remember about tomorrow. Let not all your decisions in life be only about today. So there's this reflection in the left side there, right? If today, if today you are sitting in the shade, you know, if today you have some good things in life, I hope you have enough sense to remember that not all the good things in your life came about because of what you have sown. <laughs> we didn't reap all the good things because we have sown so many good things in our life. There are other people who have gone before us who have sacrificed, who have laid the foundation, and today that's why we can enjoy shade. If today there's a tree of protection over your life, remember that it didn't grow yesterday, it didn't grow the day before. It has been there because somebody a long time ago invested in a tree, not even knowing who is going to benefit. Remember the faith of the person and the hope of the person who planted the tree. They planted a tree by using a seed, knowing that it would become a tree someday, not in their time, but in a time in the future. I think ultimately, that's what prayer is all about. It's about encouraging us, empowering us, releasing us to plant a tree. I think I'm like negative 20 minutes already. <laughs> now I don't know how many minutes I've got. Let me pray. Let's stand. God's presence this morning. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to ask that we not only be hearers of your word. Yeah, I can invite the worship team to come up if you want to. Please come up. <coughs> and uh, 